It's late afternoon on Wednesday, May 21, 1924 in Chicago. In the well-to-do South Side neighborhood of Kenwood, the school day has ended at the Harvard School for Boys. In the playground behind the school, a group of students are playing baseball. When the game ends around five o'clock, the boys head home. One of them is a 14-year-old named Bobby Franks. Bobby is one of the Harvard School's most brilliant students. Just two weeks before, as a member of the school's debate team, Bobby had participated in a debate on the subject of capital punishment. He had argued against it. A Green Willie's night automobile heading north passes by Bobby as he walks south on Ellis Avenue. The car turns around and comes back towards Bobby. A passenger in the car, 18-year-old Richard Loeb, calls Bobby over. He asks Bobby to get into the car, ostensibly to discuss a certain tennis racket he uses. As soon as Bobby is in the front passenger seat, the driver of the car, 19-year-old Nathan Leopold, steps on the gas. From the back seat, Loeb reaches a hand around Bobby's mouth to stifle his cries and begins battering over the head with a chisel. After a brief struggle, Loeb pulls Bobby into the back seat and suffocates him. Leopold and Loeb did not set out to kill Bobby Franks. They had nothing against the boy. Bobby was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, a victim of two young criminals who decided they wanted to commit the perfect crime. The murder of Bobby Frank shocked the nation. The task of trying to save Leopold and Loeb from the gallows fell to the nation's most famous defense attorney, Clarence Darrow. Darrow's efforts culminated in a 12-hour long plea. The plea, though rambling and disorganized at times, stands as one of the most eloquent attacks on the death penalty ever delivered in an American courtroom. Mixing poetry and prose, science and emotion, a world-weary cynicism and a dedication to his cause, hatred of bloodless, and love of man, Darrow took his audience on an oratorical ride that would be unimaginable in a criminal trial today. Even without Darrow in his prime, the Leopold and Loeb trial had the elements to justify its billing as the first trial of the century. The public couldn't get enough of a trial that involved the kidnapping and murder of a young boy from one of Chicago's most prominent families. To boot, it featured a bizarre relationship between two promising scholars turned murderers, a so-called act of providence leading to the apprehension of the defendants, dueling psychiatrists, and a sharp-tongued state's attorney bent on hanging the young killers. The crime that captured national attention in 1924 began as a fantasy in the mind of Richard Loeb. Loeb was the popular, handsome, and privileged son of a Sears executive. Loeb was obsessed with crime. Despite being bright enough to be the youngest graduate ever of the University of Michigan at the time, Loeb read mostly detective stories. And he didn't just read about crimes. He planned and even committed them. But Loeb's crimes had all been property crimes, theft and arson. None of them involved physical harm to another person. For Loeb, crime was a game, and he was now looking for a bigger thrill. He wanted to commit the perfect crime. Loeb's somewhat reluctant partner in crime was Nathan Leopold. Brilliant, introverted, and awkward, Though only 19 years old, Leopold already had an undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago. And in the spring of 1924, he was enrolled at the university's law school. He had also been accepted at Harvard Law School and was to begin studies there the following fall. Before moving to Cambridge, he had planned to take a family trip to Europe in the summer. Leopold's home on Greenwood Avenue, by the way, is only one block from the Chicago residence of Barack and Michelle Obama. Nathan's interests included ornithology, philosophy, and especially Richard Loeb. Leopold was gay. Loeb, it's believed, was not. Both Leopold and Loeb 
followed the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche exerted a powerful influence on early 20th century academics. The merits of his ideas contained in books like his Beyond Good and Evil were fiercely debated in places like the University of Chicago, which is located just a short walk from the neighborhood where both the killers and their victim lived. Leopold and Loeb agreed with Nietzsche's criticism of moral codes. To them, the legal obligations that applied to most people did not govern those who approached the Superman, people like themselves. Loeb and Leopold had an intense and stormy relationship. And the strange chemistry of their relationship led the two boys to do together what they almost certainly would not have done apart. Now, motives are often unclear, and so they are in the murder of Bobby Franks. We can say, however, that Leopold's attraction to Loeb was his primary reason for participating in the crime. Leopold later wrote, Loeb's friendship was necessary to me, terribly necessary. He explained that his motive, to the extent that I had one, was to please Dick. For Loeb, on the other hand, crime was an escape from the ordinary, a thrill, an interesting intellectual exercise. In return for Leopold's participation in his crimes, Loeb submitted to his friend's desire for sex. In Loeb's mind, murder was the necessary element of a perfect crime. The two teenagers spent months discussing and refining a plan that included kidnapping the child of wealthy parents. Once the child was taken, they planned to demand a ransom. Neither Loeb nor Leopold relished the idea, especially, of murdering a kidnapped victim, but they thought it was critical to minimizing the likelihood of them being identified as the kidnappers. So young Bobby Franks, an acquaintance of both Loeb and Leopold, was really collateral damage. After murdering Franks, they drove their rented car to a marshland near the Indiana line. They pulled their victim's body from the back seat and carried it to a concrete drainage culvert. They stripped Franks, poured hydrochloric acid over his body to make identification more difficult, then stuffed it into the culvert. Returning to the Loeb home, they burned Frank's clothing in a basement fire. Then Leopold got on the phone and dialed the number for the Frank's home. Bobby's mother answered. Leopold, identifying himself as George Johnson, told Mrs. Franks that her son had been kidnapped, but that he was unharmed. She should expect a ransom note soon. The next morning, the Franks family received a special delivery letter. The letter instructed them to immediately secure $10,000 in old unmarked bills and expect to be contacted again that afternoon. At about three o'clock, Leopold called Jacob Franks, Bobby's father. Leopold informed him that a taxi cab was about to arrive at his home. He should take the taxi and the ransom money to a specified drugstore in South Chicago. Franks did not get into the yellow cab that pulled up in front of his home minutes later. Why? Because seconds after Leopold hung up, Franks received another call. This one from the police. The police broke the news that the body of his son had been found. A laborer happened to see a flash of what turned out to be a foot through shrubbery covering the culvert where the body had been placed. There would be no perfect crime, but neither would there have been arrests in this trial except for what the prosecutor called the hand of God at work in this case. Investigators at the site where the body was found picked up a pair of horned-rimmed tortoise-shell glasses. The glasses, belonging to Nathan Leopold, had slipped out of his jacket as he removed it in his struggle to hide the body. Now, these glasses had an unusual hinge, a hinge found on glasses that had been sold by only one optometrist in the whole city of Chicago. The optometrist told investigators that he wrote only three prescriptions that matched the glasses held now by police. And one of those prescriptions, police discovered, was for Nathan Leopold. Two police detectives visited the Leopold home to question Nathan about the glasses. Did you lose your glasses? One of the detectives asked. Then they escorted Leopold to a downtown hotel where Robert Crow, the state's attorney, was waiting for him. Crow showed him the glasses. Are they yours? 
Leopold admitted they looked like his, but he claimed his pair was at home. Officers drove Leopold back home and allowed him to search his house for glasses. Of course, the glasses weren't there. Leopold suggested that the glasses must have fallen from the breast pocket of his coat while he was on one of his frequent birding expeditions in the marshland. Unconvinced, a detective asked Leopold to demonstrate how the glasses might have fallen out of his pocket. Leopold made a series of purposeful trips to try and dislodge the glasses from his coat, but the glasses remained in his breast pocket. Crow, leading this investigation at this point, knew he had his man, but he was far from having the evidence he needed to get a conviction. So questioning intensified. Asked about his whereabouts on May 21, Leopold said he spent the day near Lincoln Park picking up girls in his car with Richard Loeb. Loeb, questioned separately, confirmed Leopold's alibi. State's attorney Robert Crow was skeptical. Among the items picked up in a police search of the Leopold home was a letter written by Nathan that strongly suggested he and Loeb had a homosexual relationship. Still, prosecutors were on the verge of releasing the two suspects when two additional pieces of evidence surfaced. First, law school notes typed by Leopold in his, in his home were found to match the type on the ransom note right down to a malformed lowercase i. Second, there was a statement to the police made by the Leopold chauffeur, chauffeur, made in an effort to help clear Leopold. But what the chauffeur said instead spelled their doom. He told the police that the Leopold car, the same car the boys claimed to have spent the night driving around in with girls, never left the garage on the day of the murder. Was he sure about that? Crow wanted to know. Yes, he spent the evening repairing it. Well, Loeb confessed first, then Leopold. The confessions differed only on the point of who did the actual killing. Each pointed an accusing finger at the other. The Loeb and Leopold families hired, hired Clarence Darrow and Benjamin Backrack to represent the two boys. Darrow took the case in large part because it offered him an opportunity to attack the death penalty, which he, he saw as an abomination. Leopold's first impression of Darrow was one of horror. He was shocked at Darrow's unruly hair, his rumpled jacket, his egg-splattered shirt, his suspenders, his askew tie. But his opinion of Darrow changed. Leopold later described his attorney as a great, simple, unaffected man with a deep-seated, all-embracing kindliness. In his book, Life Plus 99 Years, Leopold wrote that if asked to name the two men who came closest to preaching the pure essence of love, he would say, Jesus and Clarence Darrow. The biggest single question Darrow faced was how to plead on the charges of murder and kidnapping. The confessions made an acquittal on evidentiary grounds next to impossible. He could plead Leopold and Loeb not guilty on grounds of insanity, but insanity is always a very, very tough case to win. Especially so when two intelligent and accomplished defendants are there. Moreover, if the insanity plea on the murder charge were to somehow succeed, the state could turn around and try both again on the kidnapping charge. In Illinois in 1924, kidnapping was also a capital offense. So Darrow surprised almost everyone. Leopold and Loeb pled guilty to both charges. Still, there was the matter of sentencing. With a guilty plea, the sentencing decision fell to a trial judge. If convicted by a jury, sentencing would have been a jury decision. That fact probably meant more to Darrow than any other. With the public almost unanimous in calling for death, Darrow did not want to face a jury. He much preferred aiming his arguments at the judge, John R. Cavalli, whom Darrow believed to be both kindly and discerning. In his summation, Darrow would make his thinking plain. He said, where responsibility is divided by 12, it is easy to say, 
away with him. But, Your Honor, if these boys are to hang, you must do it. It must be by your deliberate, cool, premeditated act without a chance to shift responsibility. Now here let's note it's a bit misleading to call this the trial of Leopold Moe. Although it is usually called that, the proceeding before Judge Caverly was actually a hearing in mitigation of sentence. It was a judicial proceeding to determine whether the death penalty or some lesser sentence was called for in view of all the circumstances surrounding the crime. The hearing would last just over one month. The defense hoped to build its case against death around the testimony of psychiatrists, called alienists at the time, the best psychiatric talent 1924 had to offer was sought out by both sides. Even Sigmund Freud was asked about coming to Chicago, but his poor health ruled that out. The prosecution entered the psychiatric fray reluctantly. Robert Crow argued that psychiatric testimony was admissible only if the defendants claimed insanity. Darrow and the defense argued that evidence of mental disease was a relevant mitigating factor and that it would justify a less severe punishment. In the most critical ruling of the trial, Judge Caverly ruled against the state's objection to psychiatric evidence. The alienists would be allowed to testify. Defense psychiatrist William White testified that Leopold's pathology began early in childhood Teased relentlessly, Leopold became estranged from his peers, a lonely, unhappy child who retreated into an inner world where emotion counted for nothing and intellect was all. Nathan imagined himself a slave who saved the life of his king, that is, Richard Loeb, and had thereby earned the king's gratitude. Another defense psychiatrist, Bernard Gluck, testified that Nathan's ambition has been to become the perfect Nietzschean and to follow Nietzsche's philosophy all the way through. According to Gluck, Leopold had told him that, quote, he was jealous of the food and drink that Loeb took because he could not come as close to him as did the food and drink. Gluck concluded that Leopold had a definitely paranoid personality and he was given to delusional way of thinking. As for Richard Loeb, William White described his main outstanding feature as infantilism. He's still a little child emotionally, still talking to his teddy bear. White offered these thoughts about the two boys' peculiar chemistry. Nathan and Richard complimented each other. Richard needed Nathan's applause and admiration in order to confirm his own self. But Nathan also needed Richard to play a role. Richard took the role of a king who is simultaneously superior and inferior. It was a peculiarly bizarre confluence of personalities, each of which satisfied the needs of the other. Nathan would never on his own have the initiative to murder Bobby Franks. And I don't believe Dickey would have ever functioned to this extent all by himself. So these two boys come into this emotional compact with the Franks homicide as a result. Not surprisingly, prosecution psychiatrists took a different view. William Crone testified, in my opinion, Richard Loeb was not suffering from any mental disease, either functional or structural on May 21st, 1924. There was abundant evidence that the man was perfectly oriented as to time, as to place, and as to his social relations. Leopold too, he concluded, was free of any significant mental disease. There was no evidence of any organic disease of the brain. He showed remarkably close attention, detailed attention. In addition to his expert testimony, the state presented over a hundred witnesses, proving, needlessly in the opinion of many, every element of the crime. On August 22, 1924, Clarence Darrow began his epic summation for the defense. According to a Chicago newspaper report, the courtroom was jammed to suffocation with hundreds of men and women rioting in the corridors outside. The reporter noted the wild setting underscored Darrow's argument that the court was the only thing standing between the boys 
in a bloodthirsty mob. Darrow, in a voice that rose and fell, argued his client should not bear responsibility for their crime. He referred to the defendants as boys and called them by their nicknames Dickie and Babe. Dickie and Babe, he said, were the victims of their youthful fantasies, their genetic inheritance, their surging sexual impulses, their lives of privilege, and Nietzsche's philosophy. Never before or since the Leopold and Loeb case has the deterministic universe, this life of a series of infinite chances, as Darrow called it, been so clearly made the basis of a criminal defense. Darrow argued, Nature is strong and she is pitiless. She works in mysterious ways and we are her victims. We have not much to do with it ourselves. Nature takes this job in hand. We only play our parts. In the words of old Omar Khayyam, we are only impotent pieces in the game he plays upon this checkerboard of nights and days. Hither and thither moves and checks and slays, and one by one in the closet lays. What had this boy to do with it? He was not his own father. He was not his own mother. All of this was handed to him. He did not surround himself with governesses and wealth. He did not make himself, and yet he is to be compelled to pay. Darrow concluded his point with a flourish. Tell me that you can visit the wrath of fate and chance and life and eternity upon a 19-year-old boy. Darrow also attacked the death penalty with every argument he could muster. He called it atavistic, saying it roots back to the beast in the jungle. Time and time again, Darrow challenged the notion of an eye for an eye. If the state in which I live is not kinder, more humane, and more considerate than the mad act of these two boys, I am sorry I have lived so long. Darrow favored specificity and vivid images in his speech. He took Judge Caverly to the day of execution, reminding him of the possible consequences of his decision. I can picture them, wakened in the gray light of morning, furnished a suit of clothes by the state, led to the scaffold, their feet tied, black caps drawn over their heads, stood on a trapdoor, the hangman, pressing a spring so that it gives way under them. I can see them fall through space and stopped by the rope around their necks. Ultimately, Darrow pleaded for the ascendancy of kindness over cruelty and love over hate. He even ended his marathon summation with a wish that all humans would be inspired by the words of old old Omar Khayyam, who wrote, So I be written in the book of love. I do not care about that book above. Erase my name or write it as you will. So I be written in the book of love. When Darrow finally ended his appeal, tears were streaming down the face of Judge Caverly and many other courtroom spectators. According to a newspaper account, there was scarcely any telling where his voice finished and where the silence began. It lasted a minute, two minutes. State's attorney Robert Crow closed for the prosecution. Crow was a Yale-educated up-and-comer in Illinois politics and quite a speaker in his own right. He sarcastically attacked the arguments of the distinguished gentleman whose profession it is to protect murder in Cook County and concerning whose health thieves inquire before they go out and commit a crime. Looking right at Leopold, Crow asked, I wonder now, Nathan, whether you think there is a God or not. I wonder whether you think it is pure accident that this disciple of Nietzsche's philosophy dropped his glasses, or whether it was an act of divine providence to visit upon your miserable carcasses the wrath of God. Crow heaped ridicule on Darrow's attempt to blame the crime on anyone and anything but the defendants. My God, if one of them had a hair lip, I suppose Darrow would want me to apologize for having them indicted. Crow called, Crow called the defense psychiatrists the three wise men from the East, 
and accused one of them of being in his second childhood and prostituting his profession. But Crow reserved his strongest language for the two defendants, who he referred to as cowardly perverts, snakes, atheists, spoiled smart Alex, and mad dogs. For Crow, this was a premeditated crime committed by two remorseless defendants, and the appropriate punishment was obvious. The real defense in the case, according to Crow, was Clarence Darrow and his peculiar philosophy of life. It was a defense that proved too much. If Darrow was right, no one was guilty ever. Crow said Darrow's defense was really no defense at all. Crow closed by asking Judge Caverly to execute justice and righteousness in the land. Two weeks later, Caverly announced his decision. He called the murder a crime of singular atrocity. Caverly explained that his judgment could not be affected by the causes of the crime and that it was beyond the province of this court to predicate ultimate responsibility for human acts. Nonetheless, Caverly concluded that the consideration of the age of the defendants and the possible benefits to criminology that might come from future study of the two teenagers persuaded him that life in prison, not death, was the better punishment. He said that he was doing the killers no favor. To the offenders, the prolonged years of confinement may well be the severest form of retribution. In a survey, public address scholars ranked Darrow's summation in the Leopold and Loeb case among the top 25 speeches of the century. For all his eloquence, though, it's not clear how much Darrow's summation really mattered. Based on what Caverly said in his decision, Darrow might as well have pointed out the youth of both defendants and sat down. But Darrow aimed his speech at a larger audience. Darrow often did. He challenged the morality of capital punishment, and he raised an even larger question about punishment that our legal system still struggles to answer. How should we balance individual responsibility for one's own criminal actions against the reality that those actions are strongly influenced by forces outside of that person's control? Richard Loeb and Nathan Leopold were taken to a penitentiary in Joliet, Illinois. In 1936, Loeb was slashed and killed with a razor in the shower room fight with another inmate. Leopold rushed to the prison hospital to be at his old friend's bedside as he died. Loeb's attacker claimed he was resisting Loeb's sexual advances. A story about the killing ran in the Chicago Daily News with this lead. Richard Loeb, despite his erudition, today ended his sentence with a proposition. Clever but perhaps not accurate. Prison officials called the killing an unprovoked attack and announced their intent to prosecute. Leopold kept intellectually active in prison. He taught in the prison school, mastered foreign languages, worked as an x-ray technician in the prison hospital, and reorganized the prison library. He volunteered to be tested with an experimental malaria vaccine and designed a new system of prison education. Governor Adlai Stevenson reduced Leopold's sentence after World War II, and in 1958, after 34 years of confinement, he was released. To escape the publicity accompanying the release of Compulsion, a movie that was based on the crime, Leopold migrated to Puerto Rico. There, in addition to writing a book entitled The Birds of Puerto Rico, he earned a master's degree, taught mathematics, and worked in hospitals and church missions. I heard from one of his former students in Puerto Rico who described Leopold as kind, helpful, and gracious. Leopold himself told friends that helping others has become my chief hobby. It's how I get my kicks. On August 30th, 1971, Nathan Leopold died of a heart attack. The next morning, his corneas were removed. One was given to a man, the other to a woman. The Leopold story is, in some ways, a story of redemption. 
One could argue that the last years of his life, his efforts to make up for the crime of his youth, is the most eloquent argument of all against the death penalty. 